So I've been asked um, to start off the day by briefly describing the rates and impact of trauma on women living with HIV. And I guess the take home would be that the entire HIV epidemic among women is, is fueled by violence and neglect. And that um, far more women living with HIV are dying from the consequences of unaddressed trauma than are dying from HIV itself. So I'm going to tell the story of um, how I came to understand this um, in the next 20 minutes. And it's interesting because as I've done this work, I've realized that storytelling is one of the most effective ways of healing from trauma, not coincidentally. So I am the director of the Women's HIV program at UCSF, and we were one of the first programs in the country that were specifically designed for women living with HIV, and we have an array of services that most primary care clinics in the country would be quite envious of. Uh, we have um, primary care, gynecology, obstetrics. Um, we have an incredible pharmacy program um, led by Jennifer Kokohoba. We have social work and case management um, led by amazing social workers and partners from Rita Dikasha. We have therapy, we have psychiatry in partnership with South Bend S Behavioral Health Center. Um, we have breakfast, we have partner agencies in clinic providing care with us. And we have a whole research team led by Carol Dawson Rose um, and Yvette Kuka and Martha Shumway helping us understand what we're doing. It's an amazing clinic and we do a really good job getting people onto HIV medicines and getting them to have undetectable viral loads. And so because of that, um, about 85% of our patients have an undetectable viral load. Because of that, we get all these commendations and we really thought we were doing an excellent job. But if you scratch a little bit beneath the surface, um, we realize that 50% of our patients are depressed. Uh, about 40% of our patients are using hard drugs, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, or heroin. Very few of our patients feel comfortable and safe being out about their HIV diagnosis, which means that they don't have deep, supportive friendships that can help them through their medical and social issues. Many of the women in our program are living with abusive partners. Um, very few of the women in our program are working, and if you talk to them, they want to be working. These, these women have, have very clear goals in their life that they're not achieving right now, and far too many of the women are dying. And so for a long time, we saw this reality, kind of got it in a vague sense that we were doing a great job with virologic control, that this is just the way it was. And we thought that that was um, how medicine worked and there was nothing more we can do about it. And then Rose died. So, um, and I think this is very similar to the kind of wake up and experience that, that the folks here at San Francisco General had when a beloved patient is um, either hurt or almost hurt. And so after every um, death at the Women's HIV program, we have a case conference to try to learn from what happened and to improve our care. And these are 10 of ten recent deaths of uh, 24 deaths we've had in the past decade. I'd just like to read what causes people to die in the Women's HIV program. Murder, murder, suicide, 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 addiction-related overdose, addiction-related organ failure, addiction-related lung failure, pancreatic cancer, and medication non-adherence in a hopeless woman uh, who ended up dying from uh, PML, a completely preventable brain infection. I just want to call out two of the individuals up here um, and describe them a little more in more detail. So Rose was a woman that a lot of us knew who um, was a 54-year-old woman who came to us very soft, very gentle, um, seeking safety in the midst of an increasingly vicious um, domestic violence situation. We did our best um, to help her stay safe and empower her, but in the end, her husband lured her out from where she was hiding and murdered her. Um, Pebbles, um, who's the number, who's the tenth person on this list, is a 15-year-old. Uh, was a 15-year-old. I met when she was 15 years old, and she was. Um, she came to the emergency room with a pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, an STD, and she was diagnosed through a rapid test um, with HIV at 15 years old alone in the emergency room. 
Pebbles had had a lifelong history of trauma. She, her mom was addicted to crack cocaine and was positive herself, but it never at any point in the course of her illness came out to her. Um, and later died when she was so young. She was in and out of the juvenile justice system and foster care her whole life. Um, and Pebbles uh, just couldn't take her medicines. She was totally engaged in care, totally engaged with therapy, totally engaged with case management. And uh, at some point in time, we asked Pebbles um, to get a neuropsychiatric test um, to ha help us better understand what we were missing with Pebbles. And there was one paragraph that has always spoken to me um, and helped me understand what we were missing. And it says, Pebbles is apt to find the world and all of its demands overwhelming. Life has seemed beyond her control for a long time. She does not have role models that are facing similar medical situations to gain encouragement and support from. After so many losses and so many bad experiences, Pebbles simply does not believe that the effort necessary to take her medicines will really change her life situation in any meaningful way. And so a year after Pebbles gave birth to a child, mobilized around taking her antiretrovirals, did it perfectly um, while she was pregnant, delivered an HIV negative baby, um, uh, she stopped taking her antiretrovirals and died from PML. And these women were all really different women. Um, but what I'm, why I'm describing this is, is to help differentiate the different types of trauma. And for instance, Rose um, died from murder, intimate partner violence, and Pebbles died from the lifelong impacts of trauma. And these, as you'll come to understand over the course of the day, are different, different things and require different treatments. And what we, when we looked at this list, um, we realized that these were very different women, but they were all united um, in having lifelong histories of trauma. Uh, which led to them being exposed to HIV in the first place and led directly to their deaths in the women who were murdered and then indirectly to most of their deaths uh, through substance use, depression, and suicide. And so after Rose died, we convened a meeting uh, somewhat like this of, of like 30 people who had worked in, with and loved Rose to understand um, just what to do. And this meeting was led by Lee Kimberg, who's been a mentor of mine since uh, residency um, first introduced me to, to you know, partner violence and, and this reality. And we, as a group, concluded that our, our clinics um, really didn't have the knowledge and skills, were not resourced, were not held accountable um, to have um, you know, the skills and resources to deal with the lethality that Rose faced. And I think even more importantly, didn't have the skills and resources to empower Rose and to help her develop the self-efficacy to leave this person or avoid this person in the first place. And at that point in time, a light went on for, for many of us about what was missing in this care model that we assumed was so effective, um, that we assumed was everything we could possibly do for women living with HIV that it turned out wasn't and uh, was very much missing um, you know the, the, the boat, the you know the most important, some of the most the most important issue. And at that time, we committed to doing the research and advocacy and to changing our program um, incrementally to become a trauma-informed program. And so, I'd just like to share a little bit of the research that, that we we've, we've done, understanding the rates and impact of trauma um, on women living with HIV. And so, the first thing we did was oh, so I'm going to just share some definitions with you. I'm sorry. And so. Trauma, when I first started dealing with trauma, and I don't know, most of you in this room, there's so much wisdom about trauma in this room, most of you understand trauma, have been working with this for years. I had not been working with this for years. And so this was all very new to me. And so understanding definitions is helpful because then you can develop a treatment for it. So trauma, this is a SAMHSA definition with a little bit of a, an amendment for me, is an event, series of events, or set of circumstances, such as physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, loss, community violence, or structural violence like racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, xenophobia, um, that lead to toxic stress, that is experienced by an emotional, <coughs> by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, and physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And I guess you'd call this trauma with a capital T, and it's relevant because all of these things are linked to poor health outcomes, and all of these things 
have responses and, need, and, and evidence-based responses um, and can be addressed. So a few more definitions. Complex trauma is what most of our patients experience, and that's repeated trauma, physically or emotionally, like uh, being repeatedly molested when you're a child or witnessing your uh, mother uh, be repeatedly abused by her partner or having a, an addicted parent. <coughs> PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a result or can be a result of all this trauma and includes four types of symptoms that you may recognize from patients that you work with. Re-experiencing the traumatic events, avoidance of situations that remind you of the event, negative changes in the way you think about yourself, other people in the world, and feeling keyed up. Now, complex PTSD is a variant of PTSD that includes all of the symptoms of PTSD, but is unique to people who have experienced serial trauma, repeated trauma, like so many of our patients. And it includes all of the symptoms of PTSD, but trouble regulating and handling one's own, own emotions and relationships, and feelings of profound low self-worth and powerlessness. And complex to me, complex PTSD to me was a revelation. I'd never heard of complex PTSD because it helped explain why so many of our patients were so reactive in, in our waiting room when an MA said, sit down, um, when, you know, instead of treating them more respectfully, because for obvious reasons, um, why so many patients were using substances to treat their profound anxiety, um, why our waiting room was so chaotic. And it was so helpful to me because complex PTSD actually has to treat them. So in terms of rates, so, we did a meta-analysis, a uh, combined analysis of 5,930 patients that had been reported in um, various studies across the country and combined their results and calculated um, what we felt to be the more, more accurate rates of the various types of trauma experienced by women living with HIV across the United States. And I want to call out three um, of those results um, in the next three slides. And again, the rates of trauma and PTSD among women in general are, are are, ter are, are profoundly high. Um, it just so happens that the, the, the rates of trauma and PTSD in women living with HIV are significantly higher. So 55% of women living with HIV have experienced intimate partner violence, which is approximately twice as much as the general population of women, depending on the statistic you use. 60% of women living with HIV have experienced sexual abuse. And 30% of women living with HIV have PTSD, ouch, have PTSD um, right now, current PTSD, um, and that's six times the national rate. We did another study looking at 103 of our patients, 113 of our patients, and that's where we figured out that 40% um, of our patients were using drugs, 50% were depressed, the degree of isolation and non-disclosure, difficult uh, discomfort and unsafety disclosing, and found that recent trauma in the past 30 days, this is just the conclusion slide, um, was linked to four times the rate of uh, antiretroviral failure. So this trauma wasn't just having an impact on many aspects of their life, it was having impacts specifically on virologic outcomes. So I wanna just show you the care cascade, or care continuum. The care continuum is something that I have a lot of issues with because it ends with virologic failure instead of health and well-being. And this is the general care continuum, and there's a better care continuum with higher rates for people in um, Ryan White primary care programs. So intimate partner violence and recent trauma have been associated with uh, inadequate responses in each step of the care continuum. Uh, three times more likely, people have experienced intimate par partner violence are three times more likely to wait 90 days for care, um, twice as likely to be lost to follow, um, half as likely to be prescribed antiretrovirals when they need them, uh, twice as likely to be uh, non-adherent to their antiretrovirals, and between 1.3 and four times more likely um, to not be suppressed on their antiretrovirals. People who have experienced lifetime trauma are almost twice as likely um, to not be prescribed antiretroviral therapy when medically indicated, um, and there's a significant association between lifetime trauma and medication non-adherence. The more lifetime trauma you have, the more problems with medication non-adherence you have. So in a very brief amount of time, I just want to divert a minute because I don't think this really captures the degree of impact of trauma on women living with HIV. 
So excuse me for a second, I'm going to take one, two slides of diversion into general medicine. Oh, so the impact of, of trauma goes far beyond the care continuum. It's associated with HIV incidence, faster disease progression, more hospitalizations, and almost twice the rate of death off the care continuum. Um, so there's something called the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This is a study of 17,000 patients um, at Kaiser in San Diego who looked at 10 categories of childhood abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. And they answered an array of questions regarding their own childhood experiences and associated them with adult health conditions. In that study, this is predominantly white, middle class, educated, insured patients. 64% at least reported at least one ACE category. And these are big ticket ACE categories. This is parent in prison, mentally ill parent, uh, sexual abuse. 12.5% um, reported one uh, category, 25% of women and 16% of men reported having been sexually abused during childhood. In a Philadelphia urban ACE study, 37.5% of people reported four or more ACE categories. If you have four or more ACE categories, you have twice the rate of lung or liver disease as an adult, you have three times the rate of depression, greater than three times the rate of alcoholism, greater than four times the rate of intimate partner violence, greater than five times the rate of being raped as an adult, 11 times the rate of in, in IVDU, and 14 times the rate of attempting suicide. Similar with intimate partner violence and PTSD, the same physiological, behavioral outcomes that happen because of child abuse also happen um, after uh, experiencing IPV and PTSD. And the, and the ones in pink are the ones associated with uh, problems in the care continuum. These are the social determinants of health that are mutable and associated with poor outcomes on the care continuum. And you'll see here, these are the social determinants of health on the care continuum. Substance use, depression, stigma, social support, and homelessness are the ones that are mutable and clearly associated with trauma. And I'm going to end by just showing you a graphic. Here's the care continuum. and. I looked at the space above the care continuum to try to understand why people were not successful at each stage. And one reason is because of intimate partner violence and trauma. The rest of the reasons are because of those other social determinants of health. But what's really important to notice is that trauma is associated with those other social determinants of health. And trauma underlies and propagates those social determinants of health. And unless you have an understanding of trauma and its treatment and integrated treatment for trauma into care, the likelihood of you being able to effectively address those as other social determinants of health are very limited. And that is particularly so with substance abuse, um, depression, and other mental illness. Um, why are women dying from HIV? So in the Women's Interagency HIV study, this is the largest cohort of women in the country that have been followed for uh, two decades. Um, uh, this is data that was given to me by Kathleen Weber. 17% uh, of deaths among women living with AIDS in 2012 were AIDS related. Um, the vast majority of deaths in their cohort were from non AIDS related issues that were directly or indirectly related to trauma. And in the Women's HIV program at UCSF, three of the 19 deaths, and it's now up to 22 over the past decade, were due to HIV. The rest were, were due to the conditions associated directly or indirectly with trauma um, for the most part. So in conclusion, there's a very high prevalence of trauma and PTSD among women living with HIV. Both recent and lifetime trauma have direct impacts on most stages of the care continuum for both men and women, actually, and on HIV and, mor and mortality and morbidity off of the care continuum. Both recent and lifetime trauma predispose men and women to the other social determinants, mutable social determinants of health on the care continuum, like substance use, depression, PTSD, homelessness, isolation, stigma. Beyond the care continuum, unaddressed trauma and PTSD lead to the most common causes of suffering and death for women living with HIV. And I'd like to end end by saying that understanding this connection is actually really hopeful. I mean, this is really heavy stuff you're, we're dealing with today. But it's really hopeful because there's evidence-based approaches that we can integrate into our care model um, to help women 
heal from lifelong abuse and prevent re-victimization and move and because of that, we have a mandate now to move, to raise the bar of care in our uh, clinics from a real laser focus on virologic suppression to dealing with the actual health and well-being of the individuals we're caring for. And the goal should be, from, from my perspective, not focusing on virologic control, but, but focusing on doing everything we can um, to reduce preventable death. Uh, I think the best way to do that is to focus on trauma. And I think with all the evidence and all the stories you're going to hear today, I think you'll come to that conclusion yourself. So thank you very much. What a thing to live with HIV and violence and neglect, fueling fires of trauma, silent and screaming, telling stories we must hear, we must heal. Let's speak for Rose, lured from safety, murdered by her husband. Let's speak for Pebbles, in and out of juvenile foster homes, mother of HIV-free baby, who could not find life within her control, no one like her to find support to take her pills. Let's speak for lifelong trauma, depression, abusive partners, suicide, PTSD, murder, homelessness, addiction. Let's speak for leaving women needing something more than medicine, a model of care that says, body, mind, heart, spirit, there's room for you too. What a thing to live with HIV and violence and neglect, fueling fires of trauma, silent and screaming, now being heard, being helped, seeing how fire makes light, to make more life, more whole, more healed.